Why does Jesus go through Samaria rather than around Samaria, as all Jews would do, and as disciples begged him not to do? Answering that question helps us to see this gospel in a way you have never seen it before. And therefore, also from that, to see what your relationship with Christ can be, what he intends it to be. But to do that, we have to jump into Jewish context. So let's do that. Samaria. Samaria is in the northern part of Israel. What happened after King David and after King Solomon, they united the kingdom, but what happened after that is that it divided. And the ten tribes stayed up in the north, what's called Israel, kingdom, and then another kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, is in the south with the two other tribes. And the ten tribes up in north, where Samaria is, refused to go down into Judah, which has Jerusalem, which has the temple, in order to worship God in the temple as he commanded and set up the whole kingdom of Israel. So they are not living out the worship as God has commanded them to do. And what happens then is that their worship becomes corrupted. What happens is they start to not trust in God because their worship is corrupted. And not trusting in God, then they start to trust in all the things of this world and the powers of this world. So Assyria, 800 years before the birth of Christ, Assyria comes along, big power in the region, and they, they make a bond and alliance with Syria. And, of course, Assyria is lying, and they come in and invade the northern part. And when they do that, then, they open the door to these pagan peoples, one after the other, coming in and settling, and in particular, in the region of Samaria. In fact, in the, over the hundred years then, hundreds of years up until the time of Christ, five different peoples, pagan peoples, comes into Samaria. And with them comes their pagan god. Each of them had a god. And so the Jews that are there start mixing and mingling with these pagan people, and then their lifestyles, their ideologies, their politics, their beliefs, their opinions, their worship. They start to form families with them. And over hundreds of years, they end up worshiping these five other gods while also trying, because they set up a shrine, and shr um, um, their own shrine to Yahweh, their own temple, trying to maintain a worship of, of the God of Jacob. Remember that Jacob is, he got his name changed to Israel. And his sons were the 12 sons of the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. So, so, they're trying to maintain that belief, but they're also trying to worship the things of this world. And they're lost. Okay, that's Samaria. And in Samaria is a town called Shechem, Shechem. And in that town is Jacob's well. So let's talk about a well. Wells in the Old Testament were places where men met women and proposed marriage. Like Isaac and his wife, or Moses and his wife, or Jacob when he met Rachel. It was from that place that the leader, the father of Israel, marries the matriarch of Israel, Rachel. So those are wells. Now, Jesus is getting close to Samaria, and what he wants to do is go to that well. And he does, and he waits. And one woman shows up. Because all the women, they go in the morning time. Men don't usually go to the wells. 
right? So here's Jesus alone, and a woman comes alone in the middle of the day at noon. He's been waiting for her. You see, the reason why she comes, I mean, there's all this literal stuff going on. That's all what happens. But there's a deeper meaning. The reason why she comes is because she's thirsting for the faith of her ancestors, the God of Israel, even while living this unfaithful life to Yahweh. And Jesus knows that. And it's her thirst, it's her faith that draws him there and he waits for her and waits for her. And at noon she shows up. And immediately she would have been dumbfounded. And dumbfounded not just because she's a Samaritan and he's a Jew, but she knows what he's intending. And what he's intending to do is to propose marriage to her. Not an earthly marriage, but what God has always wanted with his people. An eternal union. An eternal union of love that lasts forever and ever. He wants that holy communion with her. And she knows this. And this must have been just blowing her mind. And so they have this dialogue about water. It's all about thirst. It's all about faith, right? That leads to what Jesus says. She comes with a bucket looking for water, faith of her ancestors, faith of Jacob. And she says, okay, so how are you going to get this? He says, I'm going to give you living water. And she's like, how are you going to get this? Are you greater than our father Jacob? And in fact, he is. Because Jacob had 12 sons, and Jesus has 12 apostles. He is reconstituting a divided Israel. He's recon- and Israel is a symbol of all of us, all of God's people. He's reconstituting it. But he sends his disciples away for food so it can be just him and her first. And so he says to her, I will give you living water. In fact, I am that living water. And this must have blown her mind too because (laughs) another Jewish custom here thing. The Jews and the Samaritan had a custom hundreds of years old before Jesus. When a woman was about ready to get married to a man, before the, right before they were going to uh, consummate their union and the marital embrace, the woman took a ritual bath to become clean, to be purified. And what that did for her is that anything that was in her past was washed away so she could be fully available to her husband. And do you know what the name of that ritual bath is? Living water. Living water. And Jesus, again, this is an indication he intends marriage. He wants her to be his bride. And he's saying to her, I want to wash you. I am that washing of you. I'm that living water. I want to purify you. And how do we know this? Because of what happens next. So he says, go and get your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, I know that. In fact, you've had five husbands. And the husband you're with right now, the person you're with is not your husband. Five husbands? What Jesus is referring to is her and all of Samaria. And all the lost kingdoms of Israel. Who had five gods. Those five pagan people that came in and mixed and mingled with them, they brought their gods. And now what they were doing, one after the other, because it happened over time. One husband, next husband, next husband. And they called their gods husbands. I mean, you don't have to look any further than the Old Testament, the book of um, Hosea, where God sends Hosea after his unfaithful bride 
Gomer, to win her over. Gomer is a symbol of Israel, of his people himself. And Hosea is a symbol of God. And he wins back his unfaithful bride. So God understood and taught his people to think in terms of, I'm not just your God, I'm your bridegroom. And I intend to marry you. And so this woman and her people had five husbands. And the person that she was with right now wasn't her husband. That person, that sixth person, is intended to be God. The only God, the one true God. And because she's worshiping other gods, she's not able to give herself fully as a wife to her eternal spouse. So Jesus names it as it is. And the woman understands completely what he's talking about. Not just her life, literally, but the life of her people. She sees that he's a prophet. And in fact, he takes her further and helps her to see that he is the Messiah. And you have to understand something about the Messiah. There's a phrase for the Jews and the Samaritans about the Messiah. The long-awaited one. The one that they longed for. That they desired to be in a relationship with. Like a husband. And he says to her, the man before you, I am he. The one you've longed for all your life. And what does she do? She leaves the bucket behind. She leaves the bucket behind because she's been coming with her bucket to this well and all the other wells of her life. Trying to slake her thirst. But it's insatiable. And now she's found the one that she's longed for who has proposed marriage to her. So she leaves the bucket behind. And she goes off to her people and she tells everyone that she's found the Messiah. And come and see the one who told me everything about my life. Come and see everything that he's done for me. She's testified to him. She's witnessed to him. She's evangelizing her people. And that's why Jesus went through Samaria and waited for her. Because she had a thirst for him and faith. And he knew that when he got into this relationship with her, that she would go out and tell everyone to come to him. And to receive what they have long awaited for in their Messiah. The true God. His promises fulfilled in marriage. And so she does that. And it's interesting too. I won't say much about this part. Between the people coming to him. He has this conversation about his, with his disciples about food and about bread. Right? Right? Hang on to that part. So the women then, and the men, the people of the town, the families, they all come back to Jesus. And they say, uh, and they say, please stay with us. And he stays with them. And in staying with them, he begins to reveal to them what he's revealed to the woman. And then they say to the woman, we no longer believe because of your words But we've had experiences with him, and we believe he is the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. The reason why all this happens is not just for Samaria and the lost people in Jesus' time. This is the eternal word of God. The reason why this happens is for all of us. We are living in Samaria. There is no debating or doubting that. We're living among many people who have different beliefs in us, different values, different principles, different priorities, 
right? And they're running around, these pagan people. And some of them, by the way, are fellow Christians. Because we've been living among them for a long time, intermingling with them. And what's happening is we are taking on their values, their priorities, their lifestyles, their beliefs, their truth, and their gods. And we're worshiping those gods. I told you this over and over again. Worship is simply in its origin, to declare something worthy of my time, my attention, my energy, my love, my passion. So we're worshiping our work and our money and other people and sex and video games and TV and everything else. All the activities we run our children through, if those things replace the worship of Almighty God, then those things become gods for our children and we're ushering them to them. We are the new Samaria, right? But thank God, thank God, you're here this morning at a well. It's interesting, the early church fathers of the first 500 years always referred to the church as the well of Christ. You're at the well of Jesus who is greater than his forefather Jacob, who established 12 apostles, who established his church so that we can have a well. And at this well, Jesus is proposing marriage to us. At this well, he is offering us living water. Yes, the living water of baptize, baptism which purifies us and brings us into the life of the church, but then that's just a one and done. And it stays with us as an entrance into the well where from the side of Christ comes water and his blood. And also that discussion that Jesus had with his disciples while the Samaritans were away discussing bread, food, the Eucharist, and then they come. And we come for this living water to wash us clean so that we might be purified and ready to have an eternal union with God. Holy communion. Holy because he's communion and communion, he's holy and communion means union with. A holy union with. Holy communion with God. Jesus waits for us at this well because you have a thirst. Even though we're mingling among the many gods of this age, you still have the thirst of faith from your forefathers and foremothers, from your mothers and fathers, and our mothers and fathers from centuries ago. You have that thirst. And so you come, and you come, and God says to you, come to me, I'm living water, I'm holy communion, I'll give you the bread of life. And then in holy communion, he marries you. He, like a man going into a woman, he goes into you. And he dwells inside of you, and he wants this intimate relationship with you. And here's the thing, he doesn't care about your past. Like he didn't care about the past of this woman. And she admitted she had five husbands. And he's like, I, that doesn't matter to me. I want you. And then he can purify us. And then we have this beautiful, intimate relationship with us. And not once we get into heaven, but here and now, like with that Samaritan woman. And all of her people who came running to him. But here's the deal. Once we have this Holy Communion, let's finish this story in our own life. What, and this is the reason why Jesus teaches us. And once we have this Holy Communion, what does this woman do? We're like her, supposed to go out then and tell other people in our town, in our families, among our friendships, among strangers, let me tell you about the one that I have longed for all my life. And I have found. 
Let me tell you what he's done for me. Let me tell you what he's doing inside of me. Let me tell you about my hope. Let me tell you about my future because of him. I was one way, and now I'm another way, as the chosen says. And in between was him. He married me, and he changed my life. And then, the people that are important in your life, who are living in the new Samaria, they'll listen to your words. They'll never show up on their own here. Because a lot of times, like the Samaritans, they get God wrong. Because of all the things that are happening to them in their life, and everything that they're busy and distracted by, they get God wrong. Or God's not their priority. But they know you, and they trust you, and they will listen to you, like they listen to the Samaritan woman. And then you'll bring them here Maybe not at first to this well, to the Eucharist, but in many other activities and opportunities around our parish to grow our faith, like discipleship groups and Bible studies and conferences and retreats, and the list goes on and on. And then they have an encounter with Christ. And then they say to you the most beautiful words that a human person, a Christian, could ever hear. I no longer believe because of your words. But I believe because you brought me to him. And now I believe in him. Because of what he proposed. Because of what he proposed to me. And I'm all his. My friends, that's the meaning of this story. And that's your life.